So yeah. Hey everybody, how are we doing? What's going on? Uh, welcome back to uh, another edition of Right More Light Live. I'm your host, Brian Collins, the Executive Director of the Midwest Writing Center. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, kind of a, sort of a gloomy afternoon here in Rock Island. Uh, we're back in the Rock Island Public Library, uh, which is super great. Uh, if you live in the area and you're checking this out, uh, Rock Island Library is doing curbside service now. So we're pretty excited about that. It's very cool. Uh, so take advantage of that. Uh, let's do a whole sharing type things. Cool. Uh, so definitely check out Rock Island Public Library. They're doing a lot of terrific things. Get back uh, in the gear uh, of doing library stuff, which is pretty great. Uh, just a couple quick news and notes for the Writing Center. Um, yesterday we had our annual meeting. Uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the previous year, uh, last fiscal year. Fiscal year is calendar year, which makes it easy. Uh, so our annual report for uh, 2019 is up uh, on our website. Check it out there. Uh, or if you want your own copy, reach out. Send you one. Uh, so that's the thing. We're also we're participating in Birdies for Charity, uh, which is a is a very cool, long-standing program in Quad Cities. It's attached to the John Deere Classic, uh, which will be going on in some fashion. Uh, basically, it's a philanthropic program that allows you uh, to support nonprofits of your choice, uh, and the uh, golf tournament kicks in a bonus of five to ten percent bonus. So if you donate a little bit, you got uh, charity. These are nonprofits you want to support. You do it that way. Uh, your money goes a little bit farther. Uh, every year we've been for how long? But uh, we're fortunate to have a match. So we have five donors uh, that'll match uh, up to twenty five hundred dollars. So uh, check that out. You can go to the Birdies for Charity website, Birdies for Charity website, excuse me, and uh, you can look us up. Uh, our Birdie number is thirteen seventy. They get the website uh, really streamlined uh, with everything that's going on. Now. So it's really easy to uh, support us and anybody else you want to support. Uh, I guess the last thing is the Writers Conference. Uh, online registration is open and available. We're going to be doing things mostly like this, kind of from a distance. Uh, pretty soon we'll have everything figured out fine uh, with, uh, with St. Ambrose and, uh, and some of our other partners. So we'll know exactly how we're going to be doing everything. But it will be happening. Registration is live. Come check it out. Come join us. It'll be a lot of fun. We have fantastic faculty. Uh, several of them have books coming out this summer, which is really cool. This Len is our keynote speaker. Uh, her new book, Full Labor, is just featured on this uh, in Time magazine because she's awesome. Uh, yeah. So uh, check it out. There's, there's a lot of goodness there. I won't uh, get into all the details now, but you can find them on our website. Uh, check us out on social media. Uh, today might be a little bit heavy, uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favorite forms of writing uh, that sadly I think is, uh, uh, I mean, I guess it's probably all appropriate, uh, but it feels especially so today. So I kind of want to talk about elegies today. We kind of brought them up a couple of times uh, recently uh, in different uh, contexts. So hello, everybody who's tuning in. It's lovely to see you people. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at several poems today, uh, and for the most part, I'm going to kind of let these poems and these poets uh, speak for themselves, because I don't know um, always how much there is to add, uh, but we've got a prompt, uh, we're gonna, the prompt is jumping off a, a really well-known, uh, I guess you'd probably say a famous poem, uh, I, like, I like it when there's famous poems out the world, by, by a guy named Ross Gay, um, that I know we've talked about on here before, uh, he's a really amazing poet. It's called The Small Needful Fact. You may have seen it. Uh, it's been featured on PBS NewsHour. It's been shared very widely. It was written uh, in response to the killing of Eric Gardner uh, in 2014 in New York City. Uh, and uh, it's one of those poems that seems to sadly uh, uh, be more relevant uh, than the always relevant that it is from time to time. I think now is one of those times. Uh, so we'll get into that. We'll talk about that. Um, but right now, let's do a little uh, free write. Let's kind of reset our minds. I think we've done enough uh, prefacing 
Um, let's do some free write. So if you're looking for a free write prompt today, um, why don't we write to think about vacancy or empty spaces uh, or cesaras. That's one of my favorite words uh, in any language. Um, a blank space in a line. Or maybe a pause or a rest in music. Uh, however you want to think about it. Silence. Um, yeah, vacancy. Uh, so let's uh, get a timer on. Let's see what's going Five minutes. Keep it nice and official. Here we go. Happy running.
So at that time. Cool. Uh, um, oh, yeah. In the spirit of uh, sharing, uh, I'll, I'll read uh, and uh, I kind of took my prompt on this one. So thinking about it. They can be empty spaces. What emergency brings on the glare of memory warping in the mind to bend us over carved stones with names we're forgetting? How strange or reflecting cool the bathroom mirror makes, taking off sleep and replacing it with dreams we pay to play and subscribe to the idea of who we once were before we knew how to swim against the current in the river that is ourselves. At night, we close our eyes and cells of our own baking, droplets the size of barns made out of our tears. So, put that over there. So, let's get into uh, talking about elegies. Uh, we got Sarah on the tunes uh, that's going to be putting up uh, a bunch of the poems that we're looking at. We're going to be putting four poems today uh, with a little bit of info from. Uh, well, I guess uh, a little video, a little bit of everything. Uh, but the elegy, uh, the poetry foundation of the traditional, in traditional English poetry, it is often a melancholy poem that laments its subject's death, but ends in consolation. I think that is an important thing that we'll sort of uh, revisit. Uh, it gives us some famous examples, John Milton's Elicitus, uh, Whitman's uh, Lilac's Last is Drawing Air Blue. Uh, oh, Captain, My Captain is another one for all you Dead Poet Society fans out there. Shout out. Um, also, if you're looking for a more recent book uh, made entirely of elegies, uh, Mary Jo Van, um, her book is uh, for her songs, absolutely fantastic. So definitely check that out. Uh, we're not going to get into the form thing because none of the poems that we're looking at really follow that form particularly. Uh, but to look at another um, definition, uh, let's go to the Academy of American Poets website because we seem to do that almost every time that we get together. We're going to do that again. We've got another poem uh, from the Poem a Day series that's uh, really great. For uh, and it's kind of, you know, get this uh, introduction. We look at some of uh, the memory of W.B. Uh, Yates, uh, which is an, obviously a fantastic poem. But I'm kind of skip down a bit uh, past that. Uh, past the audio. Uh, other well known elegies include View to Death by Paul Salon, uh, written for victims of the Holocaust, uh, No Captain by Captain of Walt Whitman, written for President Lincoln. Uh, I really think uh, Salon uh, in the way uh, those poems are not just elegies for a single person, but uh, for a whole group of people, uh, for an event, for a time, for a place, I think. I think that's kind of instructive for some of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then that next paragraph. Many, many modern elegies have been written not out of a sense of personal grief, but rather a broad feeling of loss and metaphysical sadness. Um, and then we get this great uh, example uh, from the, uh, the elegies uh, by Vilka. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar. If you've never read those poems, uh, run right out and get them. Those, those are going to be easy to find. Um, but that 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 definite that that definition is, is something I really want to look at today. I think it's kind of the place where I was trying to go with the poems that I picked to look at today. Uh, you know, not written not out of a sense of personal grief, but rather a broad feeling of loss and metaphysical sadness. Uh, I think uh, I think a lot there's uh, I think there's always a lot of that going on in the world probably. Uh, but I think particularly right now, uh, there's a there's a lot uh, of that going on. Obviously, we just uh, uh, the U.S. just passed the uh, thousand uh, dead from coronavirus COVID nineteen. Uh, obviously, uh, you know specifically uh, for George Floyd uh, in the Minneapolis area. Result in protests that are going on there. Uh, last night before I went to bed, uh, I know a lot of people who live in that area. Uh, some of them uh, who were at uh, some of the protests and things like that. So, obviously, a lot of pain, uh, a lot of uh, long standing pain 
Uh, and so I thought, uh, you know, this this is a form that tries to capture that pain uh, and honor that pain uh, and remember uh, what we lost uh, as a result of the pain that we feel, the suffering that we feel. But also that uh, looks at the, the, the living that continues uh, and, and how, uh, how that pain informs. Um, so a little bit heavy today, but uh, these are heavy times, I think. Uh, so with that, I kind of want to get into uh, just looking at the poems, because I think a few of these poems, um, uh, I try to pick poems that were fairly recent. Um, I try to pick poems by a pretty uh, diverse mix of people, about a diverse uh, subjects, like who they were writing about, you know, from family members, the people they served with, uh, to themselves, to strangers to uh, societal uh, situations uh, you know, to collective ones uh, but uh you know to look at sort of like you know how these people uh, are departed and how they you know feel from those absences so the first one i want to look at today is by a guy named uh, max ripa uh it's called poem to my letter uh this poem First appeared um, in uh, in the New Yorker, uh, and that's the, the version we're going to look at today. Once they uh, pull that up, uh, his uh, his first book uh, was called uh, Four Reincarnations, uh, which is a really spectacular book. It came out actually uh, posthumously. Uh, Max uh, passed away in 2016. Um, not too long after this poem appeared in the New Yorker uh, from uh, sarcoma, which he was diagnosed with, I think, when he was a teenager. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to say too much more than that. I think, uh, as is the case with all these poems, in a way, in the way the best poems are, they're very self explanatory. So uh, I'm going to tune myself out and uh, let Sarah dive with uh, the audio, which is. Uh, which is actually a so here we go. Poem to my litter. My genes are in mice, and not in the banal way that man's old genes are in the beasts. My doctors split my tumors up and scattered them into the bones of twelve mice. We give the mice poisons I might in the future want for myself. We watch each mouse like a crystal ball. I wish it was perfect, but Sometimes the death we see doesn't happen when we try it again in my body. My tumors are old, older than mice can be. They first grew in my flank a decade ago. Then they went to my lungs and down my femurs and into the hives in my throat that hatch white cells. The mice only have a tumor each in the leg. Their tumors have never grown up, uprooted and moved. Learn to sleep in any bed the vast body turns down. Before the tumors can spread, they bust open the legs of the mice, who bleed to death. Next time, the doctors plan to cut off the legs in the nick of time so the tumors will spread. But I still have both my legs. To complicate things further, mouse bodies fight off my tumors. We have to give the mice AIDS so they'll harbor my genes. I want my mice to be just like me. I don't have any children. I named them all Max. First they were Max 1, Max 2, but now they're all just Max. No playing favorites. They don't know they're named, of course. They're like children you've traumatized and tortured, so they won't let you visit. I hope, Maxes, some good in you is of me. Even my suffering is good, in part. Sure, I swell with rage, fear, the stuff that makes you see your tail as a bar on the cage. But then, the feelings pass. And since I do absolutely nothing, my pride, like my fur, all gone. Nothing happens to me. And if a whole lot of nothing happens to you, Max's, that's peace which is what we want. Trust me. Yeah. 
thank you, Sarah, for playing that. Uh, and yeah, definitely check that out. Uh, like I said, uh, first appear at the New Yorker. Uh, but uh, you can also, there's a, an animated uh, short. Uh, it's the same audio, I believe, of, of Max reading that. Uh, so you can check that out. We'll throw, Sarah will throw that link up in the comments. Uh, so you can check that out. And it was produced by uh, WNYC uh, as part of like a podcast toilet program, I think. Um, but in any event, um, yeah, I mean, so much to talk about in this poem. And, and with the time we have, we're going to get to a lot of it. But um, I think uh, I think the thing that gets me, especially hearing it, is like the humor uh, that that he has, which um, I, I, I never met Matt, but I, fortunate to know a lot of people who did uh, and you know hearing them talk about him is one of the things that always came up was so funny um, and there's there's this humor here um, especially uh, you know, uh, they're like children who traumatized and tortured so they won't let you visit um, you know I think that line is really hilarious right before it sort of breaks and you can hear that in voice and it's really uh, I think incredibly moving um, but uh, that part you know like when, when we get that turn at the end uh, where he starts to speak uh, not to the audience but to the mice the maxes right uh that some good of you is of me that my suffering is good in part uh, i think uh wow it's uh i mean i think there's like a lot of uh um, there's there's a calling uh, to a lot of like, eastern philosophy and things like that uh, and i think there's also just uh you know a real recognition of uh, sort of what we share uh and not just uh with each other not just with people um but with the, with the world with nature uh any, with any other thing uh, and there's this beautiful callback i think to um, the great elizabeth bishop poem one art uh you know and since i do absolutely nothing I probably like my fur all gone. Uh, there's this beautiful moment toward the end of uh, Bishop's poem where uh, there's this parenthetical uh, where you write it. Uh, I, I, I love that. It's another really beautiful um, elegy sort of for, for uh, what we lose as we go through life. Um, but yeah, uh, and if a whole lot of nothing happens to you, that's peace, which is what we want. Trust me. Uh, man. Uh, just the, the the intonation of his voice uh, reading those lines is pretty pretty crushing, uh, but I think accurate. I think um, true. And I love how this sort of moves. Uh, you could say it kind of moves from uh, an elegy of the self, uh, sort of, uh, and telling the story of treatment and everything. But like. Uh, it's hard not to recognize, I would imagine, one's own place within that treatment, right? And see that sort of how that plays out in the relationship uh, between the mice uh, and what is, what is shared there in this process of you know, trying to develop some kind of uh, treatment. Uh, but then it moves sort of this to this elegy. Uh, it moves kind of from the self uh, to outside the self with the masses, uh, even if they are like children and have been traumatized and tortured. Uh, to uh, to this larger suffering that I think uh, is something that we all participate in. So uh, a lot of people have said a lot of different ways that everyone's grieving. Uh, I think this poem is a beautiful, contains a beautiful acknowledgement of that um, and that ending. Um, and that sort of uh, opening up uh, throughout the poem, starting kind of with itself and moving away from that, getting bigger, I think yeah, is also really beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think with that, we should maybe go on to the next one, because for the next one, we're going to play uh, uh, a video uh, just because it has complete context for the poem. So uh, the poem we're going to look at is a poem uh, called Eulogy by a really interesting poet, uh, Brian Turner, uh, who is a, a, a veteran of uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, he wrote a book called Hear Bullet. Uh, this uh, this video is part of. I'm not sure I get this right. Uh, we were thinking about this for Memorial Day, but also it's part of a, a project. 
uh, part of the Voices in Wartime Educational Project. So it was a pro educational project from uh, some years ago, uh, veterans uh, sharing their experience and their stories. Um, so rather than try to uh, do this any sort of justice, uh, we're going to play this video, which you can find on YouTube, um, because it's got an introduction to the poem, and then uh, Turner reads the poem, uh, and then has a little sort of putting up after it gives a little bit more context and what it talks about. Uh, well, you'll see uh, why I would include it. Uh, it is pretty heavy. Uh, this, uh, this poem's about suicide, so um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Turner, and uh, watch this video. But a little underscore. So, Sarah, please, thank you. When we came back, our brigade was put out on a parade field. And it was a sunny day. It was beautiful out. The colonel came up, gave a speech. And as he gave that speech, he listed the names of those who didn't come back with us. But as he completed that speech, or that list, uh, I realized that he hadn't said the name of, of Private Miller, Private First Class Bruce Miller, who was in Second Squad Bravo Team. I was in Third Squad Alpha Team. And, um, and I don't know why, but I, I'm kind of convinced that, uh, that maybe it was because he didn't die what might be considered a soldier's death. But um, I think that erasure is an injustice to, to his name and to his life. And if in some small way my doing this maybe changes it or reverses it in a little way, then oh, it's worth it. Eulogy. It happens on a Monday at 11.20 a.m. as tower guards eat sandwiches and seagulls drift by on the Tigris River. Prisoners tilt their heads to the west, though burlap sacks and duct tape blind them. The sound reverberates down concertina coils the way piano wire thrums when given slack. And it happens like this. On a blue day of sun, when Private Miller pulls the trigger to take brass and fire into his mouth. The sound lifts the birds up off the water. A mongoose pauses under the orange trees. And nothing can stop it now. No matter what blur of motion surrounds him, no matter what voices crackle over the radio in static confusion, because if only for this moment the earth is stilled and Private Miller has found what low hush there is down in the eucalyptus shade there by the river. Uh, he was 23, really sweet. One of the sad things was myself and my boss had to go through his personal effects and say what stays with the army, what goes back to his family, you know. Um, and I, I read that poem at West Point, and when I talked with them, this was in December of this, this past year, and I told them, I said that after that, our, our platoon was taken off our mission cycle, and somebody else took our job for the day, and we were, we were down right there on the banks of the Tigris, and they separated us by squad, and suddenly, like, all these chaplains and, like, psychiatrists came out of the, like, the woodwork, like rats when you turn the lights on or something. I'd never seen them before. Maybe they're all in the chow hall or something. I don't know. But, uh, but they were there then. They are trying to help and stuff. And the colonel came down, and we called him Lord Farquaad, because he was a short little guy. He's like, came in. And he, he walked over, and, and I'm in earshot, because the squad's right about where those two microphones in the middle are at. Maybe actually where the last two are, a little bit farther. So I can hear what he's saying, you know, and I'm just sort of listening. And he walked up, and he took his hat off. <sighs> and, and here's what he said. He said, what are three things we can do to help alleviate this situation? Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody you've worked with for the last year and a half or so, somebody that becomes part of your kind of family, takes a, a saw, a squat automatic weapon, turns it upside down, puts a barrel in his mouth, pushes down the trigger and puts six to eight rounds through the top of his skull, I don't think that's the right thing to say, you know? Um, and the reason I say this to us tonight, I said it for, to them for a different reason, but the reason is, is because I think a lot of soldiers there and a lot of soldiers coming back don't have the skills necessary to deal with the things that we have to deal with in this situation. So as a culture and as a society, we're, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's definitely true, I think, in a lot of ways. And uh, uh, I was fortunate to, uh, Brian Turner came to uh, 
Oxana College a couple years back and read for the really awesome uh, reading series, River Readings, uh, which if you live in the Quad Cities, definitely check it out. Um, so uh, things sort of get back. Um, I think it's like one of the hidden gems in the Quad Cities. They bring some really amazing writers, um, and it's always um, just a fantastic time. Um, but his his was particularly uh, moving uh, because I think if you can see from his comments before he was calm after, um, that's kind of how the whole read was. Um, and he just sort of presented everything in a, in a rich, rich uh, full context so you can sort of appreciate sort of everything that's going on. Everything that's going on, the stories that he's playing, uh, the poems, particularly the poems that have to do uh, with his experience in uh, Iraq. Uh, again, that's from a book called Here Bullet. It was published by um, Alice James Books. Uh, it came out in 2005. Uh, and that was, uh, just one more time to shout out, make sure it's this right. Uh, the Voices of Wartime Education Project. I'm definitely worth checking that out too. And I guess the only thing I kind of want to talk about uh, with that poem to kind of thread it to uh, our conversation that we're having today um, has to do with tense. Uh, I think a lot of times by nature uh, of the elegy, uh, they tend to uh, exist in the past tense. They exist in remembrance. Um, and obviously this poem is a remembrance, right? Uh, it's called eulogy. Um, and obviously this happened in the past, but the way it is written, the simple you know, uh, move of making it in the present tense, uh, I think has a lot of profound effects. It puts us uh, there in the moment as it's happening. Uh, it, it, it makes us sort of a witness after the fact to what's going on, as opposed to just telling us about, uh, about the soldier happening and where he was in the context of, or of what happened. Uh, but it also sort of remembers him um, at that moment, uh, particularly, I think, in the last three lines, because if only at this moment the earth is still beautiful, simple, simple language, but what a beautiful rendering, right? Just kind of pause everything. Uh, but present tense, right? Because if for this moment the earth is still Private Miller and Private Miller's home, what low hush is there in its down by the people with the shade there by the river. Uh, you know, it puts us into this kind of like ethereal, um, intangible space and makes it somewhat intangible through the sensory description, through making it, I think, present. Um, so I think it's worth, uh, worth remembering when, um, when we're writing on our remembrances or when we're writing an elegy. Uh, is that they need not be, uh, you know, we have permission to write whatever tense uh, we like, whatever tense we feel like will honor uh, the subject. Okay. Uh, and I think the next couple of poems we're going to look at um, sort of look outward and look forward, um, even while maybe they aren't looking back and remembering. Uh, you know, the, the first poem uh, you know, has some, we're sort of in the lab with Max as the, the, those things are happening. Uh, but there is a looking back to it. There's obviously a looking back to this poem, but also a really good present tense. The next couple of poems uh, that we're going to look at kind of jump, uh, jump from that. So um, with that, let's look at uh, another poem. We're going to go back to uh, the estimable uh, poets.org uh, and the uh, Poem Day project. Uh, this one's pretty recent. Uh, this one came out uh, actually this year. Um, Poem we're going to look at, listen to, uh, is a poem by the really fantastic uh, writer and photographer Rachel, Rachel Eliza Griffiths. Uh, the poem is called Elegy, Surrounded by Seven Trees. Uh, and it's also, uh, you know, personal remembrance. It's dedicated to her mother. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you listen to it, you know, kind of think about um, how it sort of maybe expands, uh, expands out from that. Uh, grief and that suffering and that present tense and sort of looks out beyond it, but also how it uses um, space. And there's another uh, great explanation uh, that we often get with these poem days. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Sarah so we can check the dog in. Okay. I'm Rachel Eliza Griffiths. This poem is called Elegy, Surrounded by Seven Trees. It's for my mother, Michelle Antoinette Prey Griffiths. 
Ordinary days deliver joy easily, again, and I can't take it. If I could tell you how her eyes laugh or describe the rage of her suffering, I must admit that lately my memories are sometimes like a color warping in my blue mind, metal abandoned in rain. My mother will not move, which is to say that sometimes the true color of her casket jumps from my head like something burnt down in the genesis of a struck flame, which is to say that I miss the mind I had when I had my mother. I own what is yet, which means I am already holding my own absence in faith. I still carry a faded slip of paper where she once wrote a word with a pencil and crossed it out. From tree to tree around her grave, I have walked and turned back, if only to remind myself that there are some kinds of peace which will not be moved. How awful to have such wonder, the final way, wonder itself, open beneath my mother's face at the last moment, as if she was a small girl kneeling in a puddle and looking at her face for the first time her fingers gripping the loud, wet rim of the universe. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, I think there's a fantastic list of these on poets.org. So if you go and check out the, their, their little kind of thing, essay about theology, and click on the link to read some more. This will be the first one that comes up. There's another amazing one that came out, I think, uh, two years ago by Tiana Clark. Uh, that's really, really amazing. So uh, check those out. But, and there's, again, I think, uh, you know, the poem is beautifully uh, self explanatory. Uh, but um, a couple of the things that I really love most about this poem. Um, other contradictions. Um, that first line is just so good. Um, ordinary days deliver joy easily again, and I can't take it. Uh, um, you know that ending of the the inability uh, uh, to 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 be in joy. Um, you know, uh, it's really to, to state it like that, I think it's really beautiful the way it kind of bends and the way it like the you can see with the the jam line break you know, for ordinary days deliver joy easily is such a lovely you know, uh, a poem with that first line could be going in so many directions uh, but by the end of the sentence you know and midway through the second line uh, you know, we get that it's a very different sort of uh, how that joy is being received is a it may be different than we'd expect um, just based on that first line i think that's a beautiful subversion of a wonderful contradiction that it sets on the stage for everything else that comes and we get another one of them uh, in the fourth stanza uh, uh, if only I remind myself there's some uh, and turn back if only to remind myself there are some kinds of peace which will not be moved first off that peace kind of makes me think of the, the max ripple poem and how that poem ends you know, that peace which which is what we want right which uh, is a beautiful way to state it in that in, in that poem but i think uh, part of the beauty of it, that statement is the universality uh, which it acknowledges um, and i think that same universality is at play um, in this line uh, by rachel eliza griffiths griffiths excuse me uh, but uh the contradiction how awful to have such wonder the final way of wonder itself opened to my mother's space at the last moment um, you know wonderful right uh isn't isn't wonder uh, uh, it's supposed to be some like terrific, uh, nice thing, uh, and here uh, maybe not so nice. Right. So those two contradictions at the beginning and the end of the poem, um, I think, are, are really, uh, really capture something about uh, what it's like to be grieving, uh, particularly like a, a, a fresh grieving, something that's like new, uh, where you're sort of like trying to get back into the world and feel things in a normal way. 
um, with this other thing that sort of permeates um, everything in your life uh, resists or refuses that. Uh, I think that's really lovely and a beautiful rhetoric. Uh, and that last line, as if she was a small girl in a puddle, looking at her face for the first time, her fingers dripping away. That looking out and that imagining of like possibility of what could be. Um, I think that's uh, such a lovely way to, to, to close a poem um, that is filled with a lot of grief and a lot of pain um, and a lot of difficult material. And it can say, you know, in, in the third stanza, which means I'm already holding my essence and faith, and that sort of acknowledgement of how um, when one grieves, one also. Uh, is, is, is sort of aware of um, other other loss to come, other grief to come. Uh, something that I, uh, at least I've read recently, it's called anticipatory grief, uh, which is something I think a lot of people are experiencing with uh, our current uh, strange situation around COVID-19. Uh, and something I think about, uh, you're working in exactly. uh, But yeah, I think something a lot of people have been experiencing, uh, at least uh, from what I've read. Uh, and, and just one last thing about this poem, uh, the, the way it sort of centers place, uh, just looking out ahead, this as if statement, uh, and this, uh, this kind of use of place, I think are uh, two uh, useful connections to the last point we're looking at. Griffith says, uh, I'm often more able to look clearly at these wild and gorgeous trees growing, growing old in the cemetery. Uh, than when I try to see and accept my mother's young headstone. What a lovely way to say that young headstone. Uh, the work of this poem might be today to look at both with joy. Hmm. Um, yeah, like what wonderful work to have every day. You try to you should try to see both things um, and with joy, uh, even the hard things, even the difficult things. I think it's really important um, for writers and just in general. Um, for our own uh, well being, uh, mental illness. So, uh, with that, let's turn and look at the last poem we're going to look at today. And I think it's a pretty, I hope it's a pretty excellent selection of poems. This is the one uh, by Ross Gay, which has gotten a lot of attention, uh, shared really, really widely in the six years since it's been written. Uh, or I guess five years since it's been written, six years since uh, the death of Eric uh, We're gonna we got audio for this one too. Uh, this poem has been widely shared on places. One place I want to show. Oh, it was, you can find it on a website called On B. Um, it's also part of an anthology uh, that was produced uh, by the organization Split This Rock. Um, it provides several of its poems uh, as part of that anthology and a lot of really tremendous work. So uh, we'll throw those links up. Uh, Split This Rock is a, is a really fantastic organization, a writing organization that centers uh, social justice. Uh, so definitely check them out. The link that we're going to look at today is actually uh, from PBS News Hour. The poem was featured there in July 2015. And yeah, like I said, sadly, I mean, it's a lovely poem. It's an amazing, uh, very simple, very elegant, very beautiful poem. Uh, but I think, uh, I don't think it's wrong to say that it's uh, tragic. Seems to sort of come back into circulation uh, because the circumstances under which it seems to come back into circulation um, are often terrible circumstances, uh, much like the one we had with George Floyd uh, and, and his murder. So, uh, before we look at that, there's a brief introduction by Corinne Siegel, uh, who for a long time, I think, was your poetry. Um, editor, curator at PBS News Hour. Um, if you don't know, PBS News Hour, um, I think on a weekly basis, features contemporary American poets reading their work, talking about their work. Um, that's another one of those fantastic resources that I think goes a little bit under the radar. Um, 
so in addition to PPS is discovered two months ago. And introduction is a really important, fantastic. Um, but the, the the part I want to look at here on the, uh, the PBS News Hour, uh, you know, it's kind of contextualizing uh, why he wrote the poem uh, and, and sort of making the connection to that and uh, the phrase "I can't breathe," which is uh, what Eric Gardner said repeatedly uh, when he was killed by uh, New York Police in 2014, uh, and was also what George Floyd uh, was saying. Uh, one of the things George Floyd was saying. Um, so it's kind of making a connection to that, which is also um, obviously become uh, a rallying cry uh, for a lot of, uh, a lot of the protests uh, for a lot of organizations, uh, people in the movement. Um, but this last paragraph, much of the press surrounding, surrounding Gardner is focused on the violence of his death, while the poem puts a needed spotlight on his life. Jay said, what the poem, I think, is trying to do is to say there's this beautiful life, which is both the sorrow and the thing that needs to be loved, he said. The sorrow, both the sorrow and the thing that needs to be loved. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, I think all of these poems are, are, are trying to do that in some way, shape, or form. And I think uh, it's a feature of the elegy at its best, uh, where it can do both of those things, uh, which is a great reminder uh, that we often get poetry that, you know, be a, more than a that we are capable of um, that we realize both in thought and in deed. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, and uh, we're going to play the audio of this. It's, it's, it's very short. Uh, we'll put the text up, too. Um, but uh, this is a, a small mental fact uh, by Ross Gay. Small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means, perhaps, that with his very large hands, perhaps, in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, by converting sunlight into food, by making it easier for us to breathe. Thank you, Sarah, yeah, for putting that up so we can follow up. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, a couple things uh, that are so much striking about that one, uh, but that it's one sentence. Right, with all these phrases, kind of um, the way it sort of hedges and kind of start, starts and stops a little bit, with the, and the repetition of perhaps in all likelihood, um, the, the constant presence of possibility in this poem, I think, is one of the real sources of power that it has, um, because I think it is easy to forget um, in our grief um, the beauty of that possibility right? because something seems because something that's ended uh, what is possible seems reduced or smaller um, or made more inaccessible uh, but i don't know if that's necessarily the case i often think it's not the case with a poem like this sort of points that out for us and kind of reminds us that even with loss there is a possibility uh, the other thing about it obviously you know, at the end of it uh, the way that we take this detail from uh, Eric Gardner's life that he worked with the NYC Parks uh, or Cultural Department, um, and uh, you know what, what what plants do? You know, they they make our life uh, they make it easier for us to do and make it possible uh, for our life on Earth. Uh, and I think in that way maybe we can make it uh, a little more possible, and certainly can make it a whole lot easier for each other to uh, exist together. Here on this earth. Um, so maybe we can uh, write fewer allergies. Maybe, uh, maybe this is the form uh, that is uh, maybe best of the fewer of them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, let's let's get into a little bit of prompt. We don't have a ton of time. But 
we've got a little prompt today. It's pretty straightforward, but it jumps off of this poem in particular, but everything we've been talking about today. Get my copy of it up so I know what I'm saying. So, uh, this is the prompt on Moss Elegy, a prompt we have around today. It's a small new fact. The story of what happened to Eric Gardner's tragic for many reasons. His last words, I can't breathe, have become a rallying cry over the country. And the poem Small New Fact, Ross Gay takes details from Gardner's obituary that he works for the NCIC Parks Direct for Cultural Department and reflects not only how many Gardner lived, but also the life he helps provide to those not fellow citizens of the family. As Ross Gay says to NPR with the poem, I think is trying to do is to say there's this beautiful life with its both sorrow and the thing that needs to be loved. This is often the case with poems written in the memory of someone or something. They both become a reflection of the sadness created by the loss and attempt to restore the loss in some way and remind ourselves of the good things about them to continue to remember and love. For today's exercise, write a poem or, or something else again. Uh, song lyrics, a story, it might be in memory of someone or something that you have lost. They do not have to be dead. Maybe they moved away and you just lost contact with them. It doesn't have to be that heavy or fun. And the peace can happen how you want. It does not have to be sad or somber. It can be funny or celebratory or like. I'm thinking here of you know, uh, parts of that real song. The, the brutality of the action that we're getting at the moment. To, to try to achieve some useful treatment. Uh, you know, it's graphic, it's difficult, but it's, it's shot through its humor. Uh, and I think that you know, that reflects a very particular uh, sort of looking at the, a way of looking at the world. Uh, so if your way of looking at the world is, is a humor, uh, embrace that. I don't, I don't think uh, humor and energy do not have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, try to think about how this person or thing affected you in a positive way. What did they give to you? What did they give to other people? What is unique about this person or thing that you would like other people to know about? What do you remember best about them? So pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're looking for other ideas, other examples, like I said, uh, there's a fantastic list at uh, poets.org. Pretty sure you can find another list at the Poetry Foundation. I think uh, a link. Yeah. yeah, if you look up that definition, it'll pull up a, a, a pretty, pretty solid looking list. Um, so check those out. Um, and yeah, if you want to share what you come up with, you would love to check them out. Uh, We'll be hosting our writer studio on Facebook uh, the first Saturday of June. Uh, the sixth. So you can bring it there. Uh, you can bring it there anytime. That's when uh, people are, are regular. You can bring it there. Hopefully, some people will be online uh, down to uh, talk about your work. Hopefully, you'll be down to talk about other people's work. That's kind of how it works. Uh, yeah. So we'll hang out for a couple minutes, see if anybody's got uh, any questions, any thoughts, anything like that. But uh, definitely check out uh, some more of these poems. Check out more of these poems uh, by the authors we looked at today. Max Ritlow, Brian Turner. Brian Turner has also uh, written some, some memoirs on the screen. So uh, he found that video moving. Definitely. Rachel Eliza Griffiths, like I said, is the of it, but also I uh, think that's a photographer. She's got a lot of that work out there, but definitely check that out and support her. Uh, and uh, Ross Gay, his new book, he came out this year. Uh, but his last book, Catalog on a Batch Gratitude, I think it's one, uh, one of the best books of poems I can think of. Uh, so, perfect for. Uh, Spring and summer. I think I'm definitely it. Thank you. We appreciate it. Right on. Uh, hmm. So, a little bit of 
technical difficulties it sounds like. So maybe we'll wrap it up right now. Uh, check us out online, MWC, www.mwcqc.org. Uh, check us out on the for Charity website. Support us that way. Any donations or pledges over $25 uh, results in uh, uh, a year-long membership. Uh, thanks very much to Sarah for putting up all the links and running off the, uh, the audio and video and making things uh, happen. And we'll see you here next week. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.